No other resource, nothing, and nobody has the access to anything that can provide what Jesus Christ offers. Amen. And I thank God for this blessed salvation. Amen. Go with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14. Let me share a few scriptures with you here and uh, help you a little bit. I pray it will help you. It blessed me, and I pray it will bless you. Those of you who would like to go to the Old Fort Church of God, where Pastor Bert Scott is, having revival, and uh, he called me this afternoon, excited, and uh, we are his church, and we stay in touch, and he called me this afternoon just a bubbling over. He said, we got out of church after 1 o'clock. I said, well, that's pretty much par for the course, amen, with, Z with Ziegler. He said to church, they average, I think they've been averaging in the 60s, and I think he said they had about 95 there today. Packed that building out. This is Phyllis Gibby's home church. And he said it was on. He said it was on. So thank God. We didn't expect any less, did we? Amen. But, uh, well, we're going to go. Some of us are going. If you want to go with us, let uh, just be here at the church parking lot by 6 o'clock. We'll need to leave by 6.05. It takes us an hour and a half to get there, and I'm driving. So if you'll meet us. No, it don't take but about 45 minutes with somebody else driving. <laughs> Ease your minds if you'd like to go with us. And uh, it is the Old Fort Church of God if you drive on your own. But we'd, I know they'd be blessed to see you. We'll have prayer meeting here Tuesday night. Family training hour here Wednesday night. And everything is ready and loaded and ready to go. We're ready to have another week. And we're ready to keep on worshiping him in this service. Amen. Do you feel his presence in the house? Isn't it wonderful to be in the presence of the Lord? Just to be in the presence of the Lord means everything. And then to hear anointed singing and have a part of anointed praying and anointed preaching and anointed testimonies and sanctified fellowship and a season and a time of prayer. And these old, It's just wonderful to be a part of God. This is our filling station, amen, to get refreshed, refilled, and refocused, amen, to keep going and doing what God put us here to do. Amen. Matthew 14, verses 26 through 33. And I've titled this message, Needless Fears. Needless Fears. And what I'm about to minister to you and I'll probably say it again before this message is done. And that is, I know you don't just get a quick fix in one service. When you have faith in God and trust him to help you with something, you got to start somewhere. So we try to get you pointed in the scriptures to get started. And then when you take the scripture and take God at his word and begin to turn things over to him. And I don't know about some of you, but in my years of serving the Lord... This hard-headed fella don't want to turn loose of some things to let God handle them every now and then. Some of them I freely give him. Others, for some reason, I keep holding on and tugging at it when he's trying to pull it out of my hand. Amen. So uh, we just, you learn as you go along how to deal with issues you're trying to get victory over, things you're trying to overcome, things that will help you be a better Christian and to help you fulfill the work and the will of God. And this is what we're after. Anything that's causing you to not have love and joy and peace, freedom, fullness of the blessing of God, victory to where you can enjoy serving God and live in life. God wants you to live a joyful life in a sanctified manner which is in harmony with his word. Amen? That's what he wants. And he wants us to have. He didn't create us and throw us down here to be beat up by the devil. And he didn't put us down here to get saved and live like a bunch of monks. Amen? But he put us down here to be his children, that he would have a family, that as our heavenly father, he could wrap his arms around us and love us, and we could go to him with all our concerns and love him and worship him. And this is what he wants. And one of the things I'm afraid that we hang on to too much would be these needless fears. So let's see what the book says. Go to the message uh, text, Matthew 14. Just getting a part of this. Look at this. We know he had sent the disciples after ministering. He said, I want you to go get on the boat and go on out in the sea. I'm going to go up on the mount 
I need to be alone and pray. I need some time for me. I need to get alone, and I need to talk with God, my Father. And he said, but I want you fellas to get on the boat and get out in the sea. Look at your neighbor and say, he told them to get on the boat. You think he knew what was going to happen? You better believe he knew it. He knows everything. Look at this. And when, and then you know what happened. They got on the boat and went out there and the storm came up. And then as things began to settle down a little bit, all of a sudden they saw somebody come walking towards them. On the water, in the middle of the sea. Here's what they said. And read with me. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were what? Trouble saying, it is a spirit. It's a ghost. Here are God called disciples thinking they saw a ghost. So, interesting. They're human, just like we are. And they cried out for, they were afraid. Here's somebody walking on the sea. They'd never seen that before. None of us, I don't guess, have, but they've never seen anybody walking on the sea. They are there in the boat, they know the water's deep. And here he is walking on the water. Look at this. They cried out for fear. Let's keep going. But straightway Jesus spake unto them saying what? Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, read this with me. Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, what did he do? He walked on the water to go to Jesus. He don't call us to walk on the water to, go to, to, to raise eyebrows and to say, look at me. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. Every miracle Jesus did had some connection with glorifying the Father and showing us his power and anointing and what he wants to do to help us. But when he saw what? The wind boisterous. When he saw the wind whipping around and blowing strongly, he was, second time, he's afraid. Look at this. And beginning to sink. Somebody say beginning. It's, 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 it's fearful to begin to sink. But thank God it's just a beginning. He hadn't gone under. If you feel like you're beginning to go down, beginning to lose, you got a chance to pull out of this thing. Come on now. Amen. Beginning to sink, he cried saying, Lord, save me. And Jesus is Savior. He'll save you. Amen. And eventually Jesus stretched forth his hand. And seven days later, Jesus stretched forth. And at the funeral, he raised him from the dead. See, we always wonder, when are you going to show up, God? When are you going to show up? Look at this. And immediately, what did Jesus do? Stretch forth his hand and caught him. Good God, I just felt the glory right then. Some of you thought he'd done forgot you. You hadn't seen him anywhere around. He's been holding you up or you'd have done sunk a long time ago. Come on now. If it had not been for the Lord, good God. Amen. He helps us and blesses us and keeps us going. And when we realize the predicaments we do get in and things are falling apart and we feel like everything is going down, he is there, he is there, he was there. They ought to write a song about it, amen. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and called him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. That's when it, everything that scares us comes to an end. Whatever it is that got us afraid, it will come to an end. The winds ceased. Amen. It'll come. Look at your neighbor and say, it's all going to end. Whatever's going on in your life that's got things stirred up, it will eventually come to an end. Then they that were in the ship came. They that were where? In the ship. Only one of them got out and went to Jesus. So the rest of that crowd that was in the boat, that was afraid to get out, stayed in the boat, came to him and did what? Worship. I wonder how many times we've missed that word in this text, in this beautiful passage. We're all wrapped up in Peter sinking. Instead of on the whole crowd of them worshiping. 
worship him. And worship him because they said of a truth, thou art the son of God. Thou art the son of God. Let me share with you. I've got five things I want to share with you right quickly. And uh, just, just, just to give you some heads up on this to hopefully help you with any fears. Everybody has fears, different kinds of fears. God does not want us to be bound by fears that are destroying our health, our mind, our nerves. God does not want us to be bound by fears that is making our life miserable and we can't sleep and we can't function and we can't serve God and we can't fulfill our daily duties. God does not want us to be filled with fears. Now, at the time I'm saying that, I want you to know it is natural when you see that 18-wheeler cross that line heading toward you, it is obvious, natural to be afraid and get out of the way. If I'm walking down a path and I see a snake or anything that looks like a snake. One fellow said he picked up a snake and killed a stick. Hey Amen. Be my luck, I guess. I don't know. If I see a snake, I'll be afraid and I will go the opposite direction because I don't want anything to do with it. It's natural. A lot of things are natural that we have a natural fear about. I think death is something that we, we, we begin to think about it. We begin to fearful. But then when the child of God realizes it's our passage into heaven to take that walk through the shadow of the, the valley of the shadow of death and to get through that and go on into glory. And when we begin to think of it in that context, the fear leaves. And we begin to realize our God is in control. So I want to say there are some fears that are just natural, normal fears. But those are things that are natural. You don't want to touch a hot eye on a stove. So you want to make sure you don't, you don't want to get close to a fire. Because you know it, it's going to hurt you. So that produces a little bit of fear. That's not the kind of things I'm talking about. I'm talking about the things in here. And the things that stick up here that can just go round and round and round and keep you confused and bound and, and just in a chaotic condition and this kind of stuff, God wants you delivered from that. Amen. So what did these fellas do? What did they do in order or to, to get rid of these fears, particularly looking at Peter? He's the example I want to share with you from this passage. The first thing I want you to notice he did when he was fearful the first thing he did was admitted he was afraid. He admitted he was afraid. Look at verse 26. Look at verse 26, and you'll see where he said, When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out, How? In fear. The whole group was afraid, Peter included. They were all afraid, and they cried out in fear. So they looked at something, they didn't know what it was, and they were afraid. There is an admission. They said, it is a ghost. It scared them. They thought there was something going on because they'd never seen anything like this. And I imagine if you went home tonight and saw some kind of blue or white cloud in the form of a little creature floating along your ceiling, you might get a broom. And chase it out or something. I don't know if that would work or not. But you uh, might get a little nervous about it. Might get a little nervous about it. Amen. You wake up in the night and hear some noise against your door or your window. It'll cause your skin to crawl a little bit. Say, uh-oh, something's going on. Somebody's around here. And you get a little, little afraid. So they, here they saw something coming at them on the water. And they knew it had to be supernatural. And they called it a ghost. What's your fears? What's holding you in a state of confusion or a state of bondage or affecting your joy, your shout, your blessings of life that's hindering the peace and blessings and favor that you know God wants in your life? 
what would be holding you back? Are there some fears, a fear, or many fears? And I think a lot of us have endured and got through and had to deal with several fears. Some people have a fear of rejection. Some have a fear that uh, a, a relative uh, uh, is going to, uh, maybe a husband, a wife may leave or a children may turn on them or, or things like this. Grandparents, elderly people afraid the family is going to abandon them, put them somewhere and just leave, leave them there and just let them go and this kind of thing. And some people are afraid every time they see a bruise or feel a pain immediately, cancer, 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 cancer. And they begin to thinking all these things. And doctors, when you go get them to help you, they just come right out and say, could be. They don't know any of that until they do a biopsy. I don't know how many. There have been dozens and dozens of people that have come to me and said, Preacher, pray for me. The doctor says it could be cancer. And they were upset. And I could understand that with the doctor telling me. And I said, well, how did they make that statement? They said, well, the way it looks on the x-ray. I said, they haven't done a biopsy then. I said, no. I said, let's keep praying. And after they get the biopsy, we'll still keep praying. And we've seen God take care of all of it all the way. But they don't know for sure until there's a biopsy. Get, actually get the germ in the test tube or the disease or whatever they want to call it. But nevertheless, there's a fear that is there. Amen. And so whatever that fear is, it can be removed. It can be handled. And the first thing you got to do is admit what your fears are to God. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Take it to, can he handle anything? Did he take the sin out of your life? Amen. Did he take the pain out of your life? Did he take the, the guilt and the shame and the condemnation out? Did he put joy and peace and love in the place of it? Come on now. Listen, do I, let, let me have a testimony. Praise God. Did God take all the bad stuff out and put all the good stuff in? Then why can't he handle your fears? Same God. Same power. Same care. Amen. Second thing he did, or they did, after they admitted the fears. The second thing we do is take the risk. He took a risk. Look at this. You got to face your fears. If that's Jesus, did you see what he said? If it is you, Jesus, bid me to come to you. If it's not you, don't call me. That's my rendition of the other side of the story right there. Amen. But he said, if that's you, bid me to come to you. This is taking a risk. What Peter said, Lord, I love you. If it's you, bid me to come because I know who you are. You are the blind man healer. You are the lame healer, lame man healer. You are the one that casts out demons. You are the one that raises the dead. You are the one that multiplies the loaves and fishes. You are the one that washes sins away. You are the one that mends the brokenhearted. You are the one that does all these things. And now you're showing us you can walk on the water. If that's really you, Bid me to come to you. And what did Jesus say? Come. Amen. And Peter, I don't know. I don't know if he just immediately threw his leg over the side of the boat and jumped down or if he thought about it a little while before he did. <laughs> Have faith in God, but old humanity shows up, don't it? And we begin to wonder sometimes, you know. We begin to wonder sometimes. It's like every time we eat a good meal and feel real good and full, I'm going on a fast. 40 days. Uh, Lord, we barely made it through breakfast. Amen. We're starving to death, struggling to get to lunch, watching the clock. Got the drink and the hamburger ready. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. But these things happen, you know. But take a risk. Here it is. Did you know that, that, that this thing about taking a risk and confronting your fears, and this is what he did. The risk goes hand in hand with the fear. In verse 29, he said, Jesus said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. What a huge step this is for Peter to do this with the fear of Jesus the fear of the storms and the wind and all of these. Of course, he's going to get the wind fear coming up next. But he, he feared what Jesus was, if that really was him. But he took the step and he went ahead and got out of the boat. He did something he'd never done before. 
You know what? Some folks never take their burdens to the Lord in prayer. Some folks never give it all to Jesus. Some folks never get alone with God or even come to the altars in the church and pray, God, I need help. There's pain in here. There's hurt in here. I got issues in my family. I got issues on the job. There are things going through my mind that I don't like and don't want. There are things happening with this body I don't like. Help me, Jesus. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Don't wait till everything is done collapsed. As soon as things start happening, put it in the hands of God. Put it in the hands of God. Trust him right then. If you've never done these things, well, you need to take a risk. And that is step out in faith. Good God, let me step out in faith. Amen. Even though you may go down a little further than you thought, you got somebody there that's going to get a hold of you and pull you up. And you'll find out he's the one that was holding you up before you ever got out of the boat. Hallelujah. Good Lord. He is there all the time. And Jesus is, 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 is giving him a chance to do this, but Peter takes advantage. How I many do you do notice that the rest of them stayed in the boat? Only Peter. Only Peter is the only one who took the step of faith and went to Jesus. And it's, it's rather interesting. When you take a risk, you don't take a risk based on human knowledge. When you are taking a risk as a child of God, you take the risk on the basis of the promises of God's word. Take a risk on the basis of God's promises because you know God keeps his word. So launch out and test the waters and the promises of God's word and let him know you believe him, that he'll handle everything, He'll take care of everything. So I'm going to go ahead and do the work and the will of God. And I'm trusting you, God, according to your word, that it's going to come to pass. You're going to be with me all the way through it. He is there all the time. You know that God is not a part-time God. He is not just our God on Sundays, prayer meeting Tuesday night, and Wednesday night family training hour. He is God 24-7 around the calendar. And he is there all the time. And this is important. Courage is not the absence of fear. Some people say, well, I just don't have the courage and the boldness like so-and-so does. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is doing the right thing even when you're afraid. Courage is doing the right thing even when you're afraid. Courage is doing the right thing. Even when you are afraid, you're standing for God, you'll get harassed, you'll get persecuted, you'll get ridiculed for living holiness, for admitting you're a Pentecostal, for letting people know Jesus is going to rapture us out of this world any second and they need to get ready. They may mock you, scorn you, call you everything, do all that. They call me so much it don't mean anything anymore. I said, you call me what I, whatever you want. But God calls me a child of God. Call me whatever you want. But I'm going to heaven no matter what you brand me, what you call me, or whatever happens. I'm on my way to heaven and the journey gets sweeter every day. So I'm going to go on and serve my Lord and believe in my God and rejoice in my Savior and look for heaven while you're struggling through the world, leaning on drugs and alcohol and psychiatrists and whatever else you can get to get through. I'm not leaning on Jesus. I got Jesus living inside me. He walks with me and talks with me. Great God, he's in me. Hallelujah. And he is my master. Hallelujah. Whoa, somebody shout glory somewhere right in there. Amen. Amen. What if you don't do anything with your fears? Just... Knowing you got fears, you don't do anything with them. If you don't do anything about your fears, your lack of action will add fuel to the fear. Your lack of action will add fuel to your fear. All of a sudden, a mountain seems so much larger and harder to climb because you have not done anything about it prior. Have you ever had something to cross your mind that sparked fear? And the more you thought about it, the bigger it got. And the more you thought about it, the worse things would get. And the more you thought about it, the more 
repercussions and ramifications would come up. Amen. And it just got bigger. Don't let it get that far. Cut it off at the altar. Put it in the hands of God to begin with. Put your fears in the hands of God and ask him to help you get delivered from those fears. But you've got to take the risk of reaching out by faith and saying, God, I don't like what I'm thinking. I don't like what keeps coming to my mind. I don't like this whatever I'm doing. I don't like whatever is happening in your life. You don't like God, I don't like it. I need deliverance. Now, I don't know whether you'll take that out of my life or whether you'll change me to learn to handle it and deal with it the right way. But either way, I need deliverance. Amen? Because he can do it both ways. Amen? Praise God. So take the risk, step out in faith, and launch into... There's a technical term I didn't know existed. There's a technical term for... Not, well, for letting something grow bigger and bigger in your mind, bigger and bigger, is called, if I can pronounce it right, catastrophizing. Catastrophizing. Taking something that's a fear and developing it into a catastrophe. And you know 99% of it never comes to pass. It's just the fear and the worry that crashes our nerves, stretches our faith, and gets us overbearing a whole lot of times. We allow that. You know what I think the devil does? Some of you heard me say this before. I think the devil tries to get our attention about something in our past. It can be fears. It can be things we're ashamed of. It would be something that anything that would depress us, discourage us, or bring fear. And I think he just gets us something. We are tempted by, through our senses. What we see, hear, smell, touch, or taste. So he'll work through one of those to try to trigger something in your brain that will bring back something that can depress you, discourage you, or bring you into bondage. That's his goal. And all he has to do, in most cases, if you don't learn how to handle this, he'll get your attention, think of one thing that happened in the past. Out of all that he could select, he can just take one of them and bring it to your mind and, make, and then you begin thinking of it and you just got out of a Holy Ghost filled Sunday service full of the joy and peace, ready to take on Goliath and any other devils that come against you. And here that comes. And the more you think about it, the more it goes. It's like an inflated balloon of joy in your soul. And that thing hits your mind out of, just out of nowhere. Here it comes. And then the more you think, the worse it gets, the more you think, the worse it gets, the more you think, the worse. I think he just puts a hammer in our hands and we do the rest. We beat ourselves down. We just beat ourselves down. All the devil does is put the hammer in our hands. Get to, but what you need to do is take that hammer and beat the devil with it. Say, oh, oh no, devil, this is not going to be working this time. And that's what I want to get through to you tonight. Not this time. Somebody help me say it. Not this time, devil. Not this time. This fear has been turned over to God. What you've been using against me, I'm using against you in the name of Jesus Christ. I march forward in the name of the Lord and I rebuke you in every foul spirit you've sent against me. And I rebuke you in the name of the Lord and I command you to flee and then start rejoicing in your God and praising his holy name. Take the risk. Take the risk and invite God into your life and into your whole operation. Some people, only thing they remember out of this passage is Peter sinking in the water. And they think about Jesus saying, you know, where's your faith? Where's your faith? But they don't think about this part. All the others are still in the boat. Peter is the only one that took a risk, and he got out. I always wonder about that. Just think, he's throwing his leg over the boat and knowing he's stepping into the ocean, the Sea of Galilee. Is my foot going under this water? Is this really real? Jesus, if it be you, bid me to come. It is I, be not afraid. Come. He threw his leg over and said, if that's Jesus, I'm okay. And he hit rock. I think they heard him thump when he got out of the boat. Amen. And he walked toward Jesus. Then he got his mind on the wind. 
He got his mind on the wind instead of Jesus. And when he got, he became afraid. He became afraid. I want to get to that in a minute because this is the second time fear hit him. And he got afraid and he began. Somebody say began. He began to sink. He began to sink. But you see, that's what all, a lot of folks, that's all. But you got to remember, only two people in the history of the world ever walked on water. Jesus was one. Tell your neighbor who the other one was. The apostle Peter had enough faith to take a risk to get out of the boat and God.